morning, Prince. <laughs> we'll just record. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kiran and Prince, for joining. Uh, we'll begin and uh, we'll just, uh, in the meantime, others can join. Can I ask Kiran to play, please? Yes, ma'am, sir. We'll pray. Father God, we come to the throne once again and we want to say thank you, Father God, for your, your word, your, your, your goodness and your kindness and your love, Father God, thanking you. Father God, give your wisdom and revelation, Father God, that we can understand the subject, Father God, and apply to our, uh, our life, Father God, and also apply to your kingdom, Lord, Father God, help us to understand. And the rest of the time, submitting to your hand, Father, take care of every side. Thanking you, Father. Almighty Jesus' name be praised. Amen. Amen. Okay, today we are going to begin with uh, uh, Paul's letter to Philemon. Anyone knows anything about this book, Philemon? Anything that you know about the book of Philemon? Yeah, Thomas. In Philemon, you can uh, see Onesimus is a slave uh, met, in, uh, met Paul in prison. So, sending back to uh, Philemon. So, uh, letter is a slave, the run of a slave, but back to you as a brother, receive him. And treating with the godly love, that kind of context is writing. Uh, just one chapter uh, about this book. Thank you. Yes, just one chapter. And thank you for that good introduction, Thomas. Anyone else uh, would like to share what you know about uh, Paul's letter to Philemon? Okay, just as a, you know, quick uh, brief introduction before we go into the specifics of the introduction and looking at what Paul is writing to Philemon. Uh, this is a personal letter. This is not to a person uh, that is to Philemon. Uh, it's not to any church. We know that uh, even though Paul wrote uh, the episode of First and Second Timothy and Titus, he writes it to uh, uh, Titus and uh, Timothy, but it is uh, also to be read in the church. But here, this is a more personal letter, which he writes not to any church, but uh, specifically to Philemon. Uh, Philemon is a you know rich man, and hence he has slaves, and so one of his slaves, Onesimus, uh, runs away. Uh, he runs away to Rome uh, because uh, Rome is a, a good place for him to hide because uh, it's a very popular, well, it's a hugely populated place and, uh, you know, it's easier for him to hide there. Uh, in Rome, uh, you know, Onesimus comes in contact with Paul who was there during his first Roman imprisonment and um, uh, you know, Onesimus accepts Christ uh, through Paul's uh, uh, sharing in ministry, and we see that uh, uh, you know uh, he becomes a great asset, or he becomes very useful for Paul in his ministry. Uh, Onesimus himself begins uh, ministering, um, but Paul knows that uh, you know he has to do his responsibility, uh, his. Uh, earthly and spiritual responsibility by sending Onesimus back to his master. And Onesimus also knows that, uh, you know, uh, now since he has a new perspective in life, a spiritual perspective, uh, he's born again, he's accepted Christ, uh, he agrees to go back to his master, which can even mean that, uh, you know, he'll be killed. Um, but, uh, you know, he uh, agrees to go back. And so we see that Paul is writing this letter to Philemon uh, to accept uh, uh, Onesimus back as a brother in Christ. Um, and also if, uh, because Onesimus had uh, stolen some money from uh, Philemon, Paul is willing to pay back. And um, Paul actually wants to keep back Onesimus because he's a great help for him in the ministry. So he asked Philemon the permission to do so. Uh, 
and uh, we see that uh, you know Tychicus takes this letter uh, of, uh, of to Philemon and also to uh, the church at Colossae because Philemon lived in Colossae, uh, so he takes a letter epistle of Colossians and also the epistle of Ephesians. So from there, maybe he's traveling to the city of Ephesus, uh, and he travels along with Onesimus. So this is just a basic uh, uh, background to the book of uh, Philemon. Uh, who writes this letter? Or who is the author of the book of Philemon? Who is the author of the book of Philemon? Who, like, who writes this letter? If you can't uh, unmute your mics, you can type it in the chat section. Paul, yes, it's Paul because he's writing the letter to, uh, wrote this letter to Philemon. Uh, thank you, Kanan. And uh, we see, uh, you know, Paul uh, writing his uh, name uh, in verse 1, verse 9, and verse 19. Uh, now, where was um, uh, this book? Uh, written and the date when it was written. Uh, basically, this uh, book was written uh, from Rome when Paul was in his first Roman imprisonment uh, and it was written in AD 60, uh, 61. Now, how do we know that Paul wrote this letter from his uh, first Roman imprisonment? Because uh, in this letter, Paul clearly mentions himself as a prisoner in uh, verse 1, verse 9, verse 10, and verse 23. Um, uh, so we also see that Paul's imprisonment seems to be the same location as what he mentions in Colossians, the book of Colossians, uh, because the names uh, mentioned uh, in Philemon chapter to, uh, in Philemon verse 10 and verses 20 to 24 are the same names also mentioned in Colossians chapter 4 verses 7 to 17. Uh, so we see that it's most possible that uh, he wrote uh, the epistle of Colossians from uh, his first Roman imprisonment. So the same time he's written uh, Philemon as well, the letter to Philemon. In Colossians chapter 4 verses 7 to 9, we see that Tychicus um, has been entrusted the responsibility uh, to deliver the letter to Philemon and to the church at Colossae. Uh, and he was accompanied by Onesimus. And this is the same Onesimus uh, that is mentioned in uh, Philemon. And we also see that Paul was under house arrest in Rome. And because he was under house arrest, uh, you know, he had the freedom to, uh, he was allowed visitors and co-workers to come and meet him. And that is how, uh, you know, he would have met Onesimus and Onesimus would have come and met him and he shared the gospel and Onesimus accepted. And uh, we see that Paul also had other people who would come and uh, visit him and, uh, you know, um, they would go out and do the ministry as Paul would have uh, told them to. Now, Dr. Luke, uh, who writes uh, the book of Acts, uh, who wrote the book of Acts, uh, was with Paul at Rome. And we see that uh, he also mentions about uh, the details about this in the book of Acts, because it was Dr. Luke who wrote uh, the book of Acts. And we know that Paul mentions that, um, you know, only Luke is here with me, he says in Titus, uh, he writes it uh, there and so we see and we know that, uh, you know, it was during his first Roman imprisonment and Luke was there with him. And uh, and also we see that Luke mentioning this in the book of Acts. And so we know that, uh, you know, Paul wrote it during his first Roman imprisonment. Um, he wrote this letter uh, to Philemon. Now, some people, uh, some commentary writers, some theologians say that uh, Cisteria was a location where uh, Paul wrote this letter, but it's not possible because it's not possible for uh, Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, uh, to uh, to have gone to Cisteria to have escaped to a place like Cisteria uh, because it was a very small place and he would be easily noticed. Uh, being a slave, he would have been easily noticed, but um, so he, it was very unlikely that he could have uh, uh, gone to Caesarea. 
uh, and also it was not possible for him to have uh, uh, you know have had access to Paul uh, like he would have had access to Paul in Rome because at Rome Paul was under house arrest and not in uh, Caesarea. Um, and we also see in verse 22, you know, uh, Philem, uh, Paul requests Philemon to prepare a place in his house because uh, he will be coming soon to meet him uh, because he'll be uh, released in the near future. And uh, we know that it happened uh, in his first Roman imprisonment, he was released. But that was not the case uh, at Caesarea. Uh, where Paul knew that his only hope was to appeal to uh, Caesar, okay? So it was not possible if he was in Caesarea, but we knew that uh, it was a possibility when he was in Rome, he knew he could be uh, released. So Caesarea is not the place where he wrote it from. Some uh, commentary writers, theologians say that, it, you know, it would have been Ephesus where he wrote this letter, but it's, uh, it's most unlikely because no evidence uh, exists to affirm that Paul was in prison in Ephesus. And um, it's most unlikely that the runaway slave Onesimus would have gone to Ephesus and remained there long enough to know Paul uh, since it was more than 100 miles away from Colossae. Now where um, uh, Philemon lived, where Onesimus was in Philemon's house, they lived in Colossae. So for him to escape to a place that was 100 miles would be very difficult, but it was easier for him to go to Rome uh, and also to hide in Rome because uh, Rome was a highly populated uh, place. Okay, so it was uh, from Rome and Roman imprisonment that Paul writes this letter. Um, so what is the date is probably AD 61. Uh, Paul wrote uh, this letter to Philemon. Uh, alongside his letters, uh, epistles to Colossian, to the church at Colossae and to the church at Ephesus. And we know that Tychicus, uh, you know, uh, took these letters to these places and he was accompanied by Onesimus. Um, so it's probably AD 61. Now, who is Onesimus? We already know that he is a slave of Philemon. He had stolen some money. Uh, we know this from verse 18 uh, in chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Philemon uh, that he has stolen money. He ran away to Rome, uh, which was a very highly populated uh, place and safe for him to, write, uh, to, uh, to hide. And uh, how did he come in contact with Paul in Rome? Uh, now, there are two possibilities that suggest uh, how he came in contact with Paul. Uh, the first one is Ep Epaphras, uh, who had come from Colossae uh, at that time to visit Paul. And we read this uh, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, verse 4, 12 to 13. So Epaphras, uh, who was from Colossae, which is the place where Philemon lived, uh, uh, you know, he would have come to Rome. Uh, he may have seen and recognized Onesimus uh, because we know that, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a church had, uh, uh, was meeting in Philemon's house. And we need to know that in those days, you know, uh, churches did not have their own properties, their own buildings. Uh, the Jews had the synagogues, but uh, not the churches. So they met in the houses of uh, uh, people who had big houses where they could meet. So uh, there was a church that met at Philemon's house. So we, he, Epaphras, uh, being one of the leaders of the church at Colossae, would have seen Onesimus, would have also known Onesimus ran away. Uh, so he sees him and maybe he brings him to Paul. Uh, or we, the second possibility people say um, how Onesimus met Paul is Onesimus might have, uh, you know, run out of his money, which he had stolen. And he was in desperate need. Uh, he may have been familiar with the name of Paul because Paul was at Colossae and was uh, known to Philemon as well. So maybe, you know, he would have turned to Paul as a last resort. So these are the two possibilities. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is when Paul, um, when Onesimus met Paul, Paul took a deep interest in Onesimus. Uh, we see Onesimus accepted Christ and became very useful to Paul in his ministry when he was in imprisonment. Um, uh, Onesimus became so dear to Paul that Paul calls him the son 
of the uh, son in the faith. We see this in verse 10. And we also know that Paul wanted to keep back Onesimus. We read this in verse 13. But since Onesimus belonged to Philemon, uh, you know, Paul had the social responsibility, the moral responsibility, and the spiritual responsibility to send him back to his master, even though he wanted to keep him. And so he sends him with uh, Tychicus who carried the letter to Colossian, uh, the church at Colossae, and the letter to uh, Philemon. We read this in Colossians chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. Uh, and so we see that uh, in this letter, Paul requests a Philemon to receive Onesimus as a beloved brother in the Lord, verse 10 and 16, uh, perhaps with the hope that Philemon would return Onesimus back to Paul uh, so that he can continue being useful to Paul in the ministry. We read this in verse 21. Now you, you know, you can ask this question, why a personal letter to a person, to one person is included in the Bible? You know, why it's a part of canon, uh, why it's included in the Bible? So the possibility is that the people say in AD 10, uh, the Bishop of uh, Ephesus was uh, a man by the name Onesimus. It could have been the same Onesimus who was a runaway slave. Uh, so if Onesimus was in his late uh, or early 20s, um, uh, teens, you know, he would, um, uh, when he would have met Paul and Paul wrote this letter, uh, now it was almost 70 years uh, past, so he would, uh, sorry, uh, a good uh, uh, 50 years uh, past. So, you know, Onesimus would now be 70 years old. Uh, in AD 110, and it was not an uh, unreasonable age for somebody to become a bishop in those days. And uh, we also have historical evidences that all of the letters of Paul were first gathered in a group or put together, you know, with this all parchments separated, but they were all put together in a group in the city of uh, Ephesus. And uh, maybe at the time when uh, Onesimus was the bishop, uh, and maybe Onesimus first compiled the letters and wanted to make sure that his letter uh, that was written to Philemon about him, about his contract of freedom was included in the Bible. And hence they say it's a possibility that because of that, it was, it's in the Bible. Any uh, questions on the introduction? questions on the introduction? Okay, if there's no questions, we'll uh, move on to uh, uh, Philemon chapter 1. So can one of you please read the greetings that are mentioned in verses uh, 1 to 3, verses 1 to 3. Can one of you please read verse 1 to 3, please? Yeah. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved friend, and follow level to the beloved Apia and Asripia, Pierce, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Prince. So here we see that, um, you know, in any letter that uh, Paul or epistle that he has written, um, out of the 13 letters Paul has written to churches and or individuals, in nine of them, we see that he calls, or in the introduction, in the greeting, he calls himself as an apostle in the opening verse. But in this letter, along with the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the book of Philippians and First and Second Thessalonians, in these four books, we see that Paul appealed to his to people who are reading his letter more as a friend and less as an apostle. But in all of the 13 letters that he's written, nine of them in the 
beginning opening verse he talks about himself as an apostle uh, but in the book of Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, and here in Philemon, he appeals to his readers more as a friend than uh, and less as an apostle. Okay, so but uh, we see that in this occasion, because he's writing to a friend uh, or a, a friend writing to a friend, so Paul and Philemon are friends. So uh, a friend writing to a friend, he drops his official title. He is not writing as Paul the apostle, but he's writing as Paul the prisoner of Christ. Uh, and so here we see at the very beginning of this letter, you know, Paul is laying aside all of his uh, uh, appeal to Philemon to take back Onesimus and how to treat him and send him back, uh, not based on authority, uh, but making his appeal in a very sympathetic way in love as a friend would make to a friend. And he's not trying to use his authority uh, like he uses uh, to write to the other churches when he uses his authority to establish God's uh, order in the church. Okay, so we see that when Paul talks about himself as a prisoner of Christ, you know, we I have explained this Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, when we did the uh, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus. So, um, can anyone share what is the meaning of uh, when Paul is writing? Uh, that he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Come on, we have looked at, uh, you know, uh, four books, the introduction for 2 Timothy, uh, Titus, three of them. Uh, what does it mean when Paul writes uh, prisoner of Christ? I'm sure you studied this even when you were doing the book of Romans. Can somebody share? Okay, he means that he's a servant, his beloved. Okay, thank you, Kiran. What does Paul mean when he says he's a prisoner of Christ? Come on, I've explained this so many times. I'm sure you would. Uh, you know, remember something. Okay, Paul, what he's mentioning here is basically he's not talking about his uh, physical uh, situation about uh, his, uh, you know, circumstances or the difficulties, uh, but he's basically talking about his spiritual uh, position. Uh, like Kiran said, you know, he's, um, you know, um, you know, uh, as a prisoner of Christ, he is uh, like a servant of Christ. He's under the authority uh, of Christ himself, and um, he is bound to Christ. He is dependent on Christ as a prisoner of uh, Christ, okay? So we see that he is bound to Christ. He's dependent on him. He does what uh, Christ tells him to do. He does the will of, of, of the Father. He does the will of uh, Jesus Christ. He fulfills the purpose that uh, Christ Jesus has called him from darkness to light. And so hence he talks about uh, him himself as a, a prisoner of Christ. So it's a good thing uh, to think about this uh, title, you know, prisoner of Christ, to see that such a great apostle, you know, um, talks of uh, about himself as a prisoner of Christ. It's, it's good to introduce ourselves also sometimes as prisoner of Christ. If you're somebody who feels totally bound to Christ, abiding in the wine, uh, totally dependent on him and trusting in him at all times, uh, it's a good way to uh, to uh, to call yourself that, and it's a good way to even uh, think about yourself as a prisoner of Christ. When you think of yourself as a prisoner of Christ, you know all of the 
uh, so-called titles, the powers, the position that we sometimes can crave, which can come, you know, because we're living in our fleshly nature in a fallen world, can creep up, you know, this title will remind us of who we are, where we were, and what is our calling, uh, what are we called to do. We are called not to, you know, do our own plans, our agendas, our will, but we are called here to be, uh, to be totally dependent on Christ and to do what he wants us to do and then he says uh, you know in the introduction timothy our brother so maybe timothy uh, was probably with uh, paul when he was writing this letter so he mentions uh, timothy's name uh, maybe philemon knows about timothy as well so he's sending his greetings and then he's writing um, this letter to uh, philemon uh, anyone who has any idea who philemon was from what I basically spoken about in the introduction, uh, your personal understanding, who was Philemon? Come on, I said so many things about him, so maybe some of you can point out one or things, two, two things about who Philemon is, Philemon was. Are all of you in class? We just have six of you, but I hope all of you are in class. I just spoke about Philemon, so anyone could say some things about Philemon? Come on, at least one or two points. This is very sad. Uh, there's no class participation. You know, uh, none of you put on your mics and speak. Sometimes uh, I just have to continue with a two hour lecture, which can be very boring. I don't even know if some of you are there in class listening. Uh, it's very demotivating. Okay, Dave says he's a Gentile who came to faith. Thank you. So from what I basically said in the introduction, uh, we saw that, you know, Philemon uh, had slaves because Onesimus was his runaway slave, which means he was a rich man, um, you know, um, and, uh, you know, uh, so uh, we also know that he lived in the city of Colossae because, uh, uh, you know, Tychicus takes this letter to, um, uh, you know, t takes this letter to uh, Colossae where, uh, where Philemon is living. And we also see from verse 1, uh, you know, that the church assembled uh, in his house, uh, you know, uh, he says to, you know, uh, he gives greetings to uh, Apia, Archippus, a fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. That means a church um, used to meet in, um, in Philemon's house. So maybe he has a big house because a rich man uh, he has a big house where he can accommodate a church. Um, yeah, thank you, Dave. So he lived in Colossae. He had a slave who had run away from him. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, so we see that uh, he had a church who would gather in his uh, house. Um, uh, we also see that, um, you know, he's a uh, convert of Paul. Paul had led him to uh, accepting Christ. Uh, we know this from verse 19 where he says, not to mention that you owe me your very self. That means, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, through Paul's ministry that Philemon had accepted Christ. Um, uh, he might have been converted by Paul when Paul was ministering in Ephesus or anywhere else, uh, but it's probably in Ephesus uh, because in Acts, uh, the book of Acts, Dr. Luke, who writes uh, the book of Acts, mentions about this in Acts chapter 19, 
verse 9, where it says that, you know, uh, Paul was reasoning every day in the synagogue. But uh, since the people were so hard hearted, they didn't want to uh, listen. They spoke evil of him. Um, so he withdrew from uh, the crowd, from teaching in the synagogue. And for two years, he taught at the school of Tyrenus. I, I also gave this uh, deep introduction uh, when we uh, studied uh, the introduction to First Timothy, where I, we were talking about Paul's uh, ministry at Ephesus. And I said he, for two uh, years he basically daily reasoned or taught in the school of tidiness and we know many people from Asia heard the word uh, many people accepted Christ they were built up in the faith and we see that these people go around Asia and they establish churches even in and around um, Ephesus and so we see that the seven churches that are in in uh, in the book of Revelation uh, may have been also established by these people who were trained and taught in the school of Tyrenus. So uh, it was here that most probably, um, you know, um, uh, uh, Philemon uh, would have uh, been taught and had have accepted Christ Jesus as his personal savior. Uh, we also see that, uh, you know, he was a wealthy man, so he had slaves. He had a house meeting in his, uh, uh, sorry, church meeting in his house. Uh, and also we know that he was a very kind and generous person towards fellow believers, uh, fellow Christians. And Paul mentions this and writes about this in verses 5 to 7. And also we see that he would accommodate uh, many uh, Christian believers who would be traveling around, accommodate them in his house. Uh, which uh, And that's why Paul says, I'm going to come to prepare a place for me in your house. And he mentions this in verse twenty. Two. Now Paul um, uh, addresses um, uh, Philemon as a beloved friend and a fellow laborer. So um, this shows a deep personal relationship that Paul shares with his co-workers. Uh, fellow laborer uh, would mean that, uh, you know, uh, uh, it would be reasonable for us to assume that Philemon was the church, uh, was the leader of the church at Colossae. Uh, and not Archippus, as some of the scholars say. And in verse 2, we read that, uh, you know, Paul mentions Apia, Archippus, uh, and, uh, you know, our fellow soldier and to the church in your house. So probably Apia uh, was Philemon's uh, wife. And um, some uh, scholars say Archippus was their son. Uh, some say Archippus was the pastor of the church that was meeting in Philemon's house. Um, but we see this name appear not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament. Um, but as the customs of uh, in those days, uh, you know, it was the wife, wife who was uh, basically who used to supervise the slaves in the household and hence uh, uh, this whole letter even what Paul is writing about Onesibus concerned her as well so he mentions her name um, and uh, we find this name Archippus in Colossians chapter 4 verse 17 where Paul admonishes him concerning his work he says and say to Archippus Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. So he admonishes him there um, and tells him to take heed of the ministry which God, uh, which he has received from the Lord and fulfill it. Now, uh, Paul is saying, Archippus, our fellow soldier. Um, uh, so Archippus may have been a Christian teacher in Colossae. And that is why Paul calls him as a fellow soldier. Uh, and probably he would be a member of Philemon's family as well. And the church uh, that meets in your home, uh, I already said that in those days, uh, people, uh, believers not have uh, property of their own for church buildings. Uh, they met in the houses uh, and hence we see there was a church meeting or uh, gathered at um, at um, um, Philemon's house. So there were many house churches uh, in a city and the bishop would oversee the different house churches. And verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We know grace and peace is a very uh, customary greeting uh, found in each one of uh, Paul's letters. I've already spoken about, explained about this in detail when we uh, studied First Timothy and Titus introduction as well. Uh, but we see in this greeting, 
um, since it is, um, uh, it's not uh, to a church gathering, but more to an individual, um, uh, this he makes this letter very unique uh, among Paul's uh, writings. Uh, Philemon, uh, you know, really is a personal note written by Paul to one man. And so, you know, we uh, see that uh, uh, he says, God, our father. Okay, and I'll explain to you what it means by saying God, our father. But we know that grace, mercy, and peace uh, comes from God. He's a source. He's the one who blesses us. Um, uh, or he, he's the one who blesses our lives with grace, mercy, and peace. Now, unlike other epistles, Paul does not say God the Father, but here um, he says God our Father, which means that he's talking about God who is a Father to us. Uh, and so it's basically uh, he's stating and uh, uh, trying to make this. Uh, you know, very obvious that uh, uh, obvious about the fatherhood of God uh, by giving the title God as uh, our father or God the father. So what Paul is basically saying or reminding uh, Philemon is, is irrespective of our social standing, you know, irrespective of our position or our status in society, uh, once we are all believers, you know, we have, we belong to one family, we have one father uh, that is uh, God, and uh, hence, you know, um, we are all his children, and we need to see each other as uh, uh, children of the same family, uh, and uh, under the fatherhood of God. So uh, Paul says whether we are slaves or whether we are free, whether we are male, female, uh, Jew, Gentile, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so he's not using, uh, you know, not saying God, um, you know, he's not uh, God the Father, but he's saying that God our Father. Uh, so he's talking about our uh, position and how we are all one uh, in one family, because God is our father, okay? Then he go talks about Philemon's love and faith in verses 4 to 7. So can one of you please read verses 4 to 7, please? Verses 4 to 7, anyone would like to read? Yeah. Okay. I always thank my God as remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all these holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deep deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. The love has given me great joy and encouragement because, your, because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Thank you, Siddharth. So here uh, Paul is saying in verse 4, I thank my God. That means uh, he's telling Philemon that uh, he had been such a blessing uh, to Paul uh, that he often prays for him. And, you know, he's very grateful to God for Philemon and he gives thanks to God for uh, Philemon. Uh, we see that he says, making mention of you always in uh, prayers. Uh, so we see that uh, making mention means that Paul did not always pray long, uh, intricate prayers for Philemon, but he would often, uh, when he remembers Philemon, he would often uh, mention uh, Philemon in his uh, prayer and thank uh, God okay, for him. I think this is a good thing that we can also learn. You know, um, there are different people through our different stages in our lives who have helped us in our faith journey, in our faith walk, whether it's been our pastors in the past, whether it's been uh, Sunday school teachers, uh, mentors in the youth ministry who have mentored us. You know, when we remember them, sometimes we can just give thanks to God for their lives, for, you know, the inputs in our lives, um, for uh, what they have, uh, uh, you know, done uh, to minister to us, uh, just giving. Uh, thanks here okay and um, also maybe you know write to them you know once in a while connect with them some healthy way of maintaining personal relationships um, 
and also to know how much uh, that person has uh, uh, their inputs their ministry uh, uh, in your life has been so beneficial as what it has done uh, for you so it's a good thing that we can also uh, give thanks to god and also connect with them and thank them for their inputs for their uh, uh, for their mentoring um, and for their, um, uh, you know, help in our lives. And verse 5, he says, Hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. Now, Paul had led uh, Philemon to Christ um, uh, uh, and, his, and his faith, uh, Philemon's faith had demonstrated itself in a deep love for uh, believers, uh, for fellow believers, for fellow human beings, uh, especially those who were the household of faith, that is uh, those of the church, those who uh, shared in Christ's love. Uh, Philemon was someone who demonstrated his deep love for believers uh, by being very hospitable to them, uh, by uh, sharing his resources, by, uh, you know, having people stay, who uh, believers were journeying, having them stay in their house, taking care care of their needs. Um, so we see that, um, you know, his faith was attested by works. Okay. And that is what we read also in James chapter uh, two, where James says, you know, if you uh, have faith and do not have good deeds, then your faith is good as dead. Okay, so he says you need to have faith and uh, faith and good deeds go hand in hand. If you say you have faith in uh, Jesus Christ, then the saving faith that has saved you, that salvation uh, that you receive by faith because of the grace of God, the mercy of God, that same saving faith that has saved you uh, should show itself in good works. Uh, and uh, I remember uh, talking about this in our, in our last class when we were talking about uh, the book of Titus towards the end. You know, we talked about faith and good works. Um, we also need to put our faith in action. And in the James chapter 2, uh, James uh, talks about Abraham and um, and Rahab, Abraham put his faith in action. How? You know, um, in total obedience. When God said, you know, sacrifice your one and only son, son of promise, he was willing to sacrifice. His faith went to the extent that he was willing to obey God uh, to any extent, even giving up his only son. And Rahab was a Gentile who's not even known God, not thought about God, but she's heard about everything God has done for the Israelites. She puts her faith in him. This faith and trust, you know, saves her and the family when they come, the Israelites come to attack uh, the city. Okay. So our faith should be demonstrated. If we say we have faith in Jesus Christ, it should be demonstrated in good works. It should be demonstrated in action, in the way we, uh, we trust God, uh, total uh, trust in him and also total obedience to his word and to his um, what he's asking us to do so the love of god in and through us uh, that is shown in action is the best proof of our con, con uh, our conversion and uh, it also shows that we are uh, believers in christ jesus uh, it's also a gospel that uh, uh, we don't necessarily have to preach uh, or teach but is shown in action so you know uh, our action speaks louder than words and our gospel is known through our actions to the love that uh, we show uh, to people uh, whether they are believers or non-believers so silent love is not enough you know i'm sure you all know that uh, if you tell somebody you love them and you don't show it in action that person is not going to uh, be very long with us or is not even will only thing that, you know, we only say, but, you know, we really don't love. And such a person would not even want to be with us. So we show love in action to people who we really love. And so if we love God, you know, if we say we have uh, faith in Christ Jesus and the saving faith that has saved us, you know, the saving faith will translate itself into uh, good deeds uh, and actions that we uh, in total obedience and trust in God. And then he says, hearing of your love and faith. So Paul thanked God for Philemon because of his love and faith, uh, first towards Jesus and then towards all the saints. Now we know that the word saints in the New Testament is not, uh, uh, does not describe uh, a 
true Christian uh, who's just somebody who's uh, exceptional in their uh, faith walk or their maturity, but it's just referring to all believers. Okay. And then in verse 6 says that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is, which is in you in Christ Jesus. Now in this passage, there is uh, one verse uh, which is very difficult to translate about which much has been written. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, Philemon chapter 1 verse 6. And it's the phrase sharing of your faith, which many, uh, you know, commentary writers have found very difficult to understand, to say what it really means. Uh, because the Greek word for sharing is koinonia, uh, which also means uh, fellowship and participation. So the scholars basically say that there are three possible meanings for to understand this phrase, sharing of your faith. The first thing, koinonia, can mean a sharing in. Uh, it can, for instance, mean partnership in a business. So it basically means here that your share in the Christian faith. And it might be a prayer that the faith which Philemon and Paul share in may lead Philemon deeper and deeper into Christian faith. So it might be a prayer that the faith, uh, Paul's prayer for Philemon, that the faith that Philemon and Paul share may lead Philemon deeper and deeper into Christian truth. So that is one understanding. The second one here about uh, sharing, which means koinonia, uh, which means a fellowship, uh, it can mean that, um, uh, you know, this can be a, a, Paul would have made a prayer that Christian fellowship may lead Philemon even more deeply into the truth. Okay, so that is a second understanding that is prayer for Philemon that uh, even as Philemon, you know, uh, fellowships with fellow believers, it may lead him even more deeper into the truth in God's word. The third thing can mean an act of sharing. So in this case, it will mean that uh, it's Paul's prayer that um, the way Philemon is uh, generously sharing uh, all that he has with fellow believers uh, will lead him more and more deeply into the knowledge of the good things uh, which lead to Christ. And so uh, the scholars probably say that it is the third one uh, that is um, uh, probably correct. Because basically Paul here is talking about uh, and praising Philemon's uh, generous acts and deeds, which is a characteristic of Philemon uh, and the love that he had towards uh, God's people uh, and the home that was a place of rest and refreshment for uh, many uh, believers. And so Paul is praying that uh, even as Philemon is uh, you know, more and more generously sharing all of his resources with people that will lead him more and more deeply into the knowledge of uh, the things of Christ. Uh, so Paul is saying, or Paul is asking that, you know, this generous man be grow more generous that will lead him into the knowledge of the things of God. Okay, so that is uh, basically the confusion that is there about this phrase and what is the right understanding. The sharing of your faith, uh, possibly Paul means the sharing of material things that are prompted by faith. So Paul here uh, speaks here of the works of charity in which uh, Philemon abounded towards uh, believers and also towards poor Christians. In verse 7 he says, for we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Okay. So Paul has himself derived uh, great joy and encouragement from Philemon's love, his hospitality uh, many times. And he's just uh, uh, stating it here, affirming it here. Uh, and he also remembers how wonderfully Philemon had met the needs of other Christians by refreshing their uh, hearts. And this is not something that is... Uh, he does occasionally, Philemon does occasionally, but these are things that he's regularly doing, uh, you know, and which is having lasting effects on people. Okay. Um, 
So he is not somebody who does it once in a while, but who is doing these regular acts of good deeds, of charity, of uh, of uh, you know showing hospitality to people, and this is having a great impact, a great effect in the lives of the people who are. Uh, visiting him, staying in his house, and also the church that is meeting in his house. So, you know, as um, Christian, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of us in the pastoral ministry, some of us are evangelists, some of us are missionaries, you know, we've gone and stayed in, uh, you know, when we've gone to preach or teach or minister in different places, I'm sure you've been accommodated in homes of people, uh, you know, it's good to just pause sometimes and thank God for their hospitality, for what they have done, the way they have taken care of you. And also, it's a good thing to just, you know, call them back, uh, ask how they're doing, uh, just thank them for, uh, you know, what they have done, um, and just uh, pray for them and bless them in Jesus' name. And also, it reminds us that, uh, you know, uh, we as ministers of God, sometimes we want people to minister to us. We always stand on the receiving end, but we also should be standing on the giving end. You know, uh, we would also have people come and stay in the house. We need to be open. We need to be open to that. We need to open our homes to people to come and stay, uh, men and women of God, and just minister to them. Okay. Uh, just like uh, Philemon did, who was a leader of the church, who had a church uh, in his home. So it's important that, you know, when people see our faith along with our good deeds, it just talks more about the love of Christ. So any questions thus far? Any doubts? Sorry, we've uh, I've moved way past our uh, break time, taken two minutes extra. So we'll stop here. Uh, we'll come back after 10.02. I'll give you two minutes extra. Uh, we'll come after 10.02 10 10 and then uh, we'll continue with our class. And then if you have any doubts, you can ask. Okay, we'll take a break now. <laughs>